Thank you. Okay. We have had four excellent presentations. Now we'll be open the house for questions and so on. May I make put some ground rules? First, no long speeches. One of the hands that is well known for long speeches. <laughs> I'm sharing this every time I know who speaks a lot. But everybody must be given a chance. This is an activity. So I will stick, I will not only tinkle the glass, I will decide to I'll break the glass. <laughs> so please be aware. Stick to one question, no long speeches. Introduce yourself. I'll start with yes. Mr. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you, My question to Special Principal Key and Professor Hussain is on oh, thank you. Is on poverty reduction. So Imran Khan has talked a lot about reducing poverty, bringing um, welfare, social socioeconomic changes. I'm wondering about um, the seven dollar equal system which is prevalent in the country. Many commentators state that this is a system that keeps the country back and co basically continues the cycle of poverty and it, it could cause a domino effect on other problems. Do you see reforms occurring in the country under, under the new um, Prime Minister? And do you think it is actually a, a contributing factor in the current um, issues in Pakistan? So, yeah. The answer to your question is that you have to distinguish between poverty and income inequality. Uh, Pakistan does not have much poverty. Does that come as a surprise to you? The World Bank has estimated that something like 18% of the Pakistani population lives below the poverty line, uh, compared to around 35% about 15, 20 years ago. Uh, so, so far as poverty, and you know this is a very uh, long subject to uh, address in a short answer, but the remittances from the Middle East has played an extremely important role in reducing the level of poverty. I think what's very critical is income inequality, and that has sharpened in Pakistan. And we know from other parts of the world that unless you bring incomes into rough equality, you have political instability. And that's what the country has to worry about. Yes. To, to start off with on the last presentation by Professor Rajam Mohan on foreign policy, I mean, um, you use you use terms like letting loose the Taliban and Pakistan controlling the Taliban. I think this actually you know goes against much of the research that's been done on on on, um, on Pakistan controlling the Taliban. So I mean, it, it really goes back to the traditional um, narratives that that is um, popularized in in the United States and India that. Pakistan for one, you know, controlling the Taliban, and it is in Pakistan hand to actually, um, to actually, you know, tame the, the Taliban. Then on, on India, um, you also say that you know there needs to be some change in, uh, then there needs to be some change in, in Pakistan, and then the policy with, with in India will change. Do you think that the change should come from India, India instead? Because in, in Pakistan, that change in the in mindset has already been there, and the, the change is needed in, in, in India. The, the last last point that I want to make, um, can I request that we go back to Professor Riaz, uh, Riaz Hussain Hassan's slide? Okay, I'll, I'll, make, I'll make the point. Yeah. Okay, on Imran Khan as a, as a youth leader, okay, the first thing is that, you know, in, in terms of age, Imran Khan is elder than Zaldari and so he's uh, uh, slightly younger than uh, Shabazz Sharif. The second point, uh, this was in your slide, if you look at the uh, voter participation, registered number of votes in, in registered number of voters in Pakistan is about 101 million, 52 million uh, million uh, people voted, and out of that 52 million, uh, Imran Khan only got 16 million, um, only got about 12 million. So, so I mean, so the the mandate of Imran Khan is uh, 
questionable as a you know as, as, a, as a youth leader. And partly why I've got so many seats is you know is the evil of the first first past the post system. So maybe you know Pakistan should consider um, changing the uh, rethinking first past the post. Maybe you know use proportional representation or something. Um, uh, so last last point. No, no. I think you have to go back. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Yes. Look, I mean, we are not here to discuss stated positions. If Pakistan can say, or anybody can say, look, Pakistan has nothing to do with the Taliban, you can keep saying it. But when Mr. Mike Pompeo comes and says, look, are you going to nudge them to the talks or not? That's not going to be the argument in Pakistan. The question is, Pakistan has shown, that's my view, my personal view, that they can influence them. In fact, they're the ones who brought them this far of actually sitting down in the last two years to do what little negotiations they've done. So I think you should start thinking a little more critically, not get into this narrative business, and to look at the question, the issue at hand is, what is Pakistan's attitude to the Taliban? How is it going to deal with the Pakistan peace process? So uh, you can play around that, but, but it's going to come back to responsibility uh, of uh, Pakistan, how much it has and how much it can do, uh, of course, is an issue that's going to be debated. Second look, I thought we are debating Pakistan's foreign policy, not India's foreign policy, right? So the debate is about how much change does Imran Khan can bring at this point in time. That was the debate today. We can talk about another day that India can change or not. But the fact is, I was pointing to a period of negotiating history, a recent negotiating history between India and Pakistan, where most of the very difficult issues were actually negotiated upon. And as Mr. Manmohan Singh said at the last press conference in 2014, he said we were close to a deal. Why the deal fell apart? I mentioned that both sides, there are problems. They're selling the deal to domestic constituencies in both the countries has been historically very difficult. 2012, 2013, Pakistan offered MFN, UPA government negotiated, came very close to clinching a deal on uh, hydrocarbon transfers, MFN trade, overland transit, many of the issues were discussed. But last minute, there were people shooting it down. So I was pointing to the domestic political difficulties on both sides. It's not just, so please don't get into this thing of are we choosing between India and Pakistan. I think we've done quite a bit of that. Analytically today, looking at these structural problems that confront the most well-intentioned leaders on both sides to change this dynamic between India and Pakistan. Uh, just a brief comment on uh, Raja Mohan's uh, uh, presentation as well as his response now. If uh, uh, Pakistan played a role uh, to solve the Pan problem means working with the Taliban and getting them to the negotiating table, that ain't going to work. Uh, Pakistan is not going to be able to solve the Afghanistan problem that way. The only way it can solve the Afghan problem is to develop the tribal areas. Bring uh, social and economic development to the tribal areas and get them to work on job creation, education, uh, emancipation of women and so on and so forth. Uh, what the Americans said, what uh, Trump said on August the 21st, is no solution to the Afghan problem. Afghanistan is going to be much worse than what it is today, no matter what Pakistan does. And what's going to happen is that under both Islamabad and Kabul begin to understand that it is the economic and social development of the people that uh, Riyadh Hudson was talking about, 40, 45 million per town, uh, of food population. This is going to remain uh, Best thing so. Just one thing. Just a small thing. It's not. I'm not saying what ought to be done. I think development is a long-term thing. That's not going to happen overnight. Even with the best of good, you know, intention, very efficient people. But the issue today, the policy is always short-term. The near-term issue is the Taliban is getting ready for a dramatic, big offensive. It has sanctuaries inside Pakistan. And what the Americans are saying is that look, either you push them out. Or you can get them to the negotiating table. I mean, maybe it is true that Pakistan does not have them to, but the fact is 
the judgments of the rest of the world today are going to be made on what happens. And my sense is Kabul is getting weaker by the day. So it's not just Kabul and Islamabad working together. Actually, it could be Taliban could be very close to uh, gaining more territory. So I think the, the issues are going to change very quickly. And I think the political dynamic, the security dynamic is altering so fast, which is going to shape the international perception, but rightly or wrongly. That's, that's my limited point. Can I, can I just uh, answer? Oh. Just uh, to let it uh, No, it's a question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my question is to Mr. Robert Berkey, and it's about the economy. You mentioned that one one thing that uh, Iran Khan's new government wants to do is make the government and the economy more self reliant. But I'm wondering, given the, the whole rent-seeking economy in Pakistan, given how indebted it is currently, most notably to China, and it's probably going to have to go to the IMF, and which is just going to you know, continue this path of, um, my question to you is how? How is it going to become more self-reliant when there are all these sort of structures that uh, invested interests that keep on bringing Pakistan's economy to the brink. Thanks. Very good question. Very easy to answer. <laughs> uh, you change your fiscal system. You make it very difficult for people to take money out unless they pay taxes on it. There are billions and billions of dollars that are lying outside Pakistan owned by Pakistanis on which taxes are not being paid. I had a conversation over here in Singapore a couple of years ago with a very large, uh, the, owner, uh, the head of a very large bank. And he said to me, Pakistan is one of the largest capital exporters to his bank. And he said, I can't understand why that is happening because we pay only 0.25% interest on that. I said it's very easy to understand because they're escaping 40% tax back home. So you combine 40% with 0.25% in US. So Imran, I think, understands this. His people who are in the cabinet understand this. You need to have a very, very firm law, uh, which would make it very difficult for Pakistanis to escape the tax debt. Uh, just to give a personal example, when I left the World Bank, uh, we were on, uh, uh, we didn't pay any taxes on our salaries. And we were leaving, we were told by a lawyer that don't play games with IRS, now that you are in a taxable bracket. And IRS will do anything to get money from you that you owe them, even take your wife away. So if you have that kind of uh, fear put into the uh, hearts of the people, Taxes will come. And then China issue is a, another one which we can talk about. Yes, you want to? No, I'm just. Uh, and you're right. I mean, the actual board that uh, PTI got was about 31% of 50, uh, you know, 50 million or 70 million. And the PML was about 5 million less, but 30, about uh, 12 million. And I think most of. So the, the idea that somehow Imran Khan had this. Um, landslide victory is probably overly optimistic but the fact remains that it is uh, probably only during the Bhutto, Zulfalim Bhutto's period, PPP was the one party which actually controlled uh, two or three provinces, uh, provincial states, uh, state assemblies and this is the first time that PTI has actually con is controlling the uh, KP, Kabul, Pakhtunwa, and Punjab. I think this hold in Punjab is very tenuous because my own reading uh, an analysis of election results is that uh, PML uh, was the major uh, vote, um, um, the, the one most votes, but they were actually the leakage from the PML bank to leverage Pakistan with 2.95 million is actually what cost them the Punjab election. But the fact remains, it's the first time that a party after almost 20, 25 years, uh, more than that, actually has a representation in at least two provinces, possibly three provinces, which is quite an achievement. 
uh, and that makes it a national party, uh, more of a national party. Because one of the points I want to make is that Pakistan uh, election uh, voting pattern has been essentially tribal by ethnic. Punjabis have voted for Punjabi parties, Sindhis have voted for Sindhi parties, and Pashtuns have voted probably mixed of the voting. And Balochistan is a very small population. And this is the first time they have been actually uh, a, 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 a provincial power held by this party which actually controls the centre, which is a very good development, but we have to see how it plays out. Yeah. I'm going to take two or three questions together because we are running out of time. Yes. My name is Sunil Gulian. I live in Singapore. Uh, I'm addressing this to Riyasa. Your analysis are always very, very useful and educated. Uh, I was surprised to see that there is such a large population, a Punjabi-speaking population in Pakistan as compared to India. But I believe you have uh, Saraiki has been clubbed with Punjab. Is, is that correct? Yes. Yeah, uh, to the question. I'm sorry. Okay, I, my, my, my question is. Yes. Uh, is Saraiki club with Punjabi? Yes, it number is, one. It, it is part of it. And, and then is Saraiki going to get some sort of uh, separation in terms of a suba or a, or a department in a university? Or <laughs> well, they have been. I wish it was here. Yeah, like there have been some I ideas which you can I think yeah. I'm just a boring sociologist. I don't really know. But, but I think Syriaki and, the, and there are movements within Punjab to actually create more provinces within Punjab. It is a very large, it has large population, 100 million Punjabis, a dwarf the population of Pakistan, they are almost 50 percent. But uh, you know, then you remember, not long ago, only 100 years ago, the KP was part of Punjab, so it became a separate province. But there are differences within Punjab, but I think, uh, again, if you were to ask an anthropologist, they would say that the, the links within different Sayakis and other parts of Punjabis uh, are much closer than they are links between, between them, they are closely knit uh, cultural group or cohesive group than Punjabi and Pashtun and Punjabi and Sindhi and Balochis. So, um, to, to answer your question, yes, it, it, it improves Punjab as it is, uh, uh, as it exists today, yes. So, but, sorry, sorry. No, but that's just basically, uh, I mean, Punjab is, uh, I'm just using Punjab as defined by the Pakistani, by Pakistani state. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chairman. My question is addressed to the You have a script? Yeah. Uh, no, it's you seem to be very optimistic over the state of the Pakistan's economy. And you said that you have gone through four publications while preparing this speech. One of them, the New York Times on August 18, says that Pakistan's total debt, uh, foreign exchange reserves, is a mere uh, $10.1 billion. And its total debt to China stands at about $62 billion. And before the elections, China gave Pakistan $2 billion and $1 billion in April. Now the question is, how is Pakistan going to pay back China this amount? And how long will this 10.1 billion dollar foreign exchange reserves last? And there are some stories today in the international media which says that uh, China is planning to build a gated city of half a million Chinese workers in Gwadar, which will be restricted only to Chinese uh, workers there. And the Pakistan is there. Your comment on that? Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. My name is Danish Sutash. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Danish uh, I have a question for uh, Mr. Riaz. Uh, uh, you said that uh, in your closing statement, you said more of the same, Ron Khan. Uh, KP is the only province. KP has never re elected a, uh, the same party again. And this is the first time that KP re elected PTI. So he must have done something right over there. So that perhaps it was not more of the same. So I'd like you to comment on that. Uh, and one uh, for uh, Professor Bowman uh, about uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan having control over there and things and sanctions. That's a very good narrative. Uh, you know, would you you'd be surprised to know that Pakistan is building a fence on the Afghan-Pakistan border? The US are not doing it. 
And if you're thinking that a major offensive in Afghanistan can take from Pakistan, I mean, uh, I don't know what to say about the research. It's uh, 140,000 American soldiers in Afghanistan. Can't make a difference. What can a few Taliban, let's say even if they are crossing over, can do? Uh, <coughs> just a follow-up uh, question on what? Oh, I'll get you a turn. Yes, wait a minute. Just a quick follow-up on what Mr. Berkey and Mr. Mohan was talking about, the resolution to the Afghan problem. It's always talked about Taliban and Pakistan and the United States being the players. Um, I'm not an expert on Taliban, but there are multiple Taliban, as I think about it, like, for example, there's a misnomer about Pakistan Taliban, which is headquartered actually in Afghanistan, and attacks Pakistan, I mean, allegedly 140 school children in Peshawar that were killed by, by the Pakistan Taliban, which is in Afghanistan. Many people in the West don't understand that difference. It is not based on that. My question is, in terms of the resolution to this, could there be another external player for the Taliban? I, as a spoiler, a Russia, which at the time had vested interests in the 80s, headed up by Putin, and they were embarrassed. Could they be involved in perhaps embarrassing the United States by the same token, by having them not achieve that face in the uh, your question about uh, New York Times numbers, the way newspapers uh, use these numbers uh, creates the impression as if the repayment is to be done today or tomorrow or day after. This has to be seen in a dynamic framework, not in a static framework. The money that uh, China is giving Pakistan is coming in many different forms. And nobody knows better than this guy over here because he's giving some of this money on behalf of the Chinese. Uh, it's coming in on commercial loans, it's coming on subsidized loans, it's coming in as grants. It is coming in to be paid back over a 10 to 15 year period. By that time, I have estimated that this would add at least one to one and a half percentage point to Pakistan's growth rate. So the country is much larger, the economy is much larger from which payments are going to be made. So it's not today that we are going to start paying this money back. It is going to be over a longer period of time. Now I have dealt with the Chinese for a very long time and I have negotiated with them lots of things. They will never put a country like Pakistan in jeopardy if they think that that's what's going to happen. I once borrowed $500 million from the Chinese and it is still lying in the Pakistani Reserve Bank, the Pakistani Bank. So repayment to China is not going to be a problem. The Western press talks about it, even Pakistanis talk about it. It's not an issue. You think about uh, the Taliban. Uh, <coughs> Just to repeat what I said earlier on, there ain't no military solution. Uh, this is what the Americans want, and they're going to lose out very badly. Uh, it's been going on for 17 years, and they haven't done anything in order to secure the areas that they wanted to secure. Only a couple of years ago, there was an attack on Basri, and there was an attack on Kabul. The only, and I had a very long conversation with Ashok Ghani on this point. Uh, and he said two things to me. And I said to him, you're totally wrong. One of them was uh, somebody raised the question of uh, pushing the Taliban out of Pakistan. And I said, is that what you want? He said, no, because we don't have the means to control them. So I said, what do you want? He said, I want Pakistanis to kill all Taliban. And I said, is that feasible? He said, what's happening is, and this is his phrase, he said, all the world's trash is being thrown into Afghanistan, and we can't deal with this. Uh, when he became finance minister of uh, Afghanistan under Karzai, he came to see me, and we had a long conversation. And I said to him, Ashraf, concentrate on the economic, social development of the tribal areas. This is where both Taliban, your Taliban and Pakistani Taliban, have created sanctuaries because they are very unhappy with the state's inability to deliver what they want. Unless you change that dynamic, no amount of military stuff is going to help out. 
Well, I think um, about the, you're absolutely right. I think uh, the KP election this time is very uh, interesting and reassuring because KP has had in the last several election thrown out the, the ruling party in the government. This time they elected, like, re they, they re elected the PDI, that government, which is actually a, a very encouraging. So, in a way, uh, you have offered, you know, as a counter to my argument, more of the same. Uh, I, I think I go back to the, the, the geography and demography of Pakistan. Pakistan geography is a very complex and complicated, and it actually confers on certain institutions more power than they would like to have. Um, but obviously, the reason why Pakistan KPI has uh, KP has actually re-elected the same government, probably the answer lies uh, and subject to further research because it focused on doing something in the most deprived areas of Pakistan. If you go to UNDP book, Pakistan UNDP report, uh, Pakistan Development Report 2017, you will find in that report a list of districts, all Pakistan, ranked according to the HDI, Human Development Index. The, the least developed index uh, districts are in the in KP and in, in the uh, tribal areas. And I think Javed is absolutely right. You want to do something, you want to bring about, and the most developed districts are by the way, all in Punjab, most of them are in Punjab, some of them are most in Karachi. So there is enormous disparity, development disparity uh, in Pakistan. And the unfortunate part is that I have no, I still don't understand why the tribal areas, and if I were to tribal, I'd be fighting like hell. Because, you know, what happens in tribal areas? Military goes uh, and carries on operation, and then these people become displaced people within Pakistan. And there are almost a million displaced. I, I can't exactly figure it the last I remember. But the point is that they probably PTI government, uh, and I have to check this, did more for the district, for the uh, for the under, underdeveloped districts, and this is what they uh, delivered them dividends. Interestingly, also in the same, almost the same districts which are least developed in KP, in, in KP are the ones that have voted for the most orthodox Muslim uh, MMA, the most uh, the orthodox Muslim party. You see, there are two. One point I want to make, there are two traditions of Muslim Islam in South Asia and in Pakistan. And one is the Bayhu, which is the popular Islam, which is shrines, and the peaks are the basically iconic representation. <coughs> Whereas the other one is the Diobandi Islam, the Orthodox Islam, where mostly it's the ulama and the most scripturalistic Islam. Now, what is interesting is that it is not the uh, the Diobandi election uh, uh, votes have not come from the more developed areas. They have come from the least developed areas, if you go and look at the distribution. So in a way, uh, two things are very, very puzzling for the uh, yes, KP election. To quick Quickly. Two things are very interesting. One is the KPI actually has done something for the district that has delivered the dividend. Secondly, the same districts actually also have produced, have elected more uh, Orthodox Muslim Party, which is which has more vote in, in KPI than Yeah, can I just briefly something as well on the uh, KP issue? In my own view, there are two primary reasons for PTI's victory. Uh, be very brief. One is social services, especially the universal health care system that PTI implemented, the Sehat scheme. And that was very successful. There's problems, of course, but it's very successful in KP, and so it drew a lot of support. The other point, very briefly, is the, a lot of members of the PTI mainstream a lot of discourse that was previously the domain of the religious parties. So they got that vote as well. So the Bareilly voted lost in that case. Look, I, you know, I'm willing to suspend my disbelief, although I followed what's happened in Afghanistan for the last 40 years, and accept what you're telling me. Pakistan has nothing to do with Taliban. Taliban is absolutely an indigenous force. 
and that it's really a problem between the Americans and the Taliban. They have to solve it out. I'm willing to buy that. If you can sell that argument to Mike Pompeo, who's the just you know coming from CIA to the State Department, you can tell him uh, this is what our position is. Uh, have good luck with that. But but the point is this: the CIA worked with Pakistan and the jihadi groups to oust the Soviet occupation in Afghanistan for ten full years. Then they worked with the Pakistanis and the Pakistani establishment to get the Taliban to power in the mid 90s. After 2001, they've been working with Pakistan trying to defeat the Taliban. It does not work. That's what it is. Now, it is Americans today saying we want a political settlement. Help us get a political settlement and say Pakistan has the role to help us get a political settlement. But if you say, look, no, 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 uh, we will. The smart idea to help the Americans be defeated in Afghanistan, even better luck with that. If that is what the strategy is, uh, I don't think that will be Pakistan's strategy. I think there is a negotiation that's about to begin between Washington and Islamabad, saying, look, what is it that we can do? Can we work together to produce an outcome? And how much is Pakistan willing to do? So I would say the threat of a full scale Taliban offensive is part of the bargaining that is beginning at this point in time. So I would say, wait and watch what goes on. It is not our job as analysts to say who's right, who's wrong. Uh, the question is, there is a condition today that the Americans feel after 17 years, they're going to go back, staring at defeat, there will be certain consequences. That might be a great idea. No, no, I'm just, that might be a great idea. I'm saying, for Pakistan as a state, that would not be a great idea. That they would want to see this as helping America at this point, rather than seen as helping defeat America. And I think that's where the question is, it's about the terms. What are the terms that we worked out between the two is what is going to be consequential. And not, I mean, it's not our job to say who's right, who's wrong. We just say, here's a new moment, and the moment how the analytically gets played out is the, is the, is the question. Yeah, just next, just, next batch of questions. I think that's ended. Did we there? Uh, thank you, Mike. Okay. Questions of the domain of uh, uh, social economic development. I'm deeply encouraged by what Professor Iqbal Sevi had just said in concluding our comments, that what really helped uh, in, the, in the KP area was the delivery of public health services. Mr. Khan has laid a lot of stress on education, uplifting the poor, and so on and so forth. Um, it's not just a fiscal issue, but a lot is contingent upon public administration and delivery of uh, public services through the administration. That's the lesson we can take from Singapore as well. Uh, as an encouraging example in the state of Punjab, yeah. the primary and secondary school changes have been remarkably successful. Do you see any evidence or any thinking allowed in the part of the new government to revamp uh, public delivery services so the benefits of all the expenditures get to those for whom they actually intended? Thank you. Questions to? Uh, to Mr. Burki and uh, anybody else on my panel. Okay. Yeah. Sir, I would like to add to that question. If something of that <coughs> happens, like the governance, there's a, Imran Khan said in this speech that the governance, improving like institutions, is like a prime focus, would that in effect also, in the long run, if it happens, also dilute the impact of the military on foreign policy or stuff like that? Okay. Those are the last questions. Your, your question about KP and his performance, a uh, uh, couple of things. Uh, where KP government, where uh, PTI government in KP had enormous success was in the area of health. They uh, make hospitals work for the people rather than hospitals working for the poor, uh, for the rich. They got uh, doctors to attend hospitals rather than their own clinics. They came up with a name, a new framework, which was very strictly enforced by Imran and his people. Although Imran was not directly in charge of KP, but his people were. So it is doable. Good government is possible if you have the will to enforce it. And he showed that he did have the will. And that's why uh, his party has succeeded the way it did after having the government for five years. The other major change that he brought about is on in land disputes. Uh, the uh, 
the villain of the piece, as you know, in all rural areas is the Patwari. And what Imran and his people have done, they have uh, used, they have computerized land records. And now land records can be changed. You go to uh, a person who handles the computer and what's called, the, uh, I forget that uh, there's a technical word for it. Uh, that gets changed on the computer. The Patwari doesn't have to put it on a piece of cloth. And that's been an amazing uh, improvement also. He's also worked in police. And police now works for the people rather than uh, getting money out of the people. So it's, been, it's, it's a story of success. I don't want to oversell the thing, but this point that this is one time that one government has succeeded after having ruled for five years and staying in power is because of these uh, kinds of things that have been. Uh, okay. Yes, we yes. have. I've got one thing about Imran Khan, which is I have, I think he's a very intelligent man, uh, but he seems to always mis misuse or at least misquote the statistics. I mean, he has a very exaggerated view of how many poor are in Pakistan, how many marvelous children are in Pakistan, etc. Some of the developmental figures that he has been using actually are not, not correct. Uh, the situation is much better than what he says. Now, uh, I just wanted to plug in a, a self-promotion for Javed, Mr. Khad and myself. About four years ago, we did a book, Afghanistan, The Next Phase. It's published by, it's an ISIS book, published from Melbourne University Press. I strongly urge you to go and have it, buy a copy of it and read it, and I think you will find some of the answers that you are raising in that book. And we get only 5% of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, comment. Uh, well, um, just to join in on that uh, the discussion on delivery services, the Sales Alert Scheme, which was launched in the KP, as I said, was successful. And that is actually promoted as a cornerstone of his vision of the Islamic welfare state. So it's you know, something that sells. Actually, it's, people can see visible reforms. But one slight issue with that, where the cynic should come in as well, is that that program was funded by the German Development Bank. So the money that launched that program came to there. So now when we want to expand that to a whole Pakistan level, which I hope is it's possible, because that would be fantastic, and I would uh, just conclude by saying that uh, we got to take a, a cautiously optimistic view of the potential for change in Pakistan under Imran Khan. Uh, there are times when a man and a woman to come together. That structurally speaking, and I think uh, some of the gains that Pakistan had made last 40 years have been tested today. Therefore, uh, a, a personality like Imran Khan, I think, uh, could help reorient some of its domestic politics and reorient some of its international politics uh, at this juncture. So I would think that, uh, uh, no point rushing to a quick judgment, but I think to wait and see how we can contribute to the process. And I think as analysts, our job is to see the potential for change and not here to take positions uh, for or against. That's not our job. Our job is to see uh, Pakistan is at the inflection point, a point where uh, it could move in a direction where it comes back into higher uh, growth rates, uh, takes its natural as a large country, equipped with nuclear weapons, one of the largest armed forces. Uh, Pakistan has a large role in the international system. Uh, but today, given the factors that stare at it, the question is, how does it take this moment to stare itself back uh, into playing a larger role <coughs> in the world and in reasonable harmony uh, with its neighbors, which is what Mr. Burkisa uh, talked about. So, so I would say uh, it's a good moment to carefully watch Pakistan and carefully study uh, where it's going to go in the next two months. Thank you. In any seminar or discussions of this type, the winner of the piece is always the chairman. <laughs> because he has to keep time. We are about half an hour behind time. But I think we had a good discussion. From ISAF's point of view, our, the, uh, the resources we have devoted to Pakistan have been underutilized in China. But as uh, Professor Adamohan says, this may be an opportunity. Now, if we take an optimistic view and move in 
try and understand what is happening. I think if you come to the analysis once you have understood. At the moment, I'm not sure we all understand. At least not the general public, maybe the, the academia does understand. But I think there are still far too many questions unanswered. And I hope that uh, we can now start looking at Pakistan uh, with a view of deepening our knowledge of the country. And we will do this as we go forward. And uh, we have another uh, program on Pakistan, I think. What is that? Uh, on the 30th. Yeah. 30th. This is on uh, women. So there's one more. And we will have this and we will have exchange of, uh, uh, of scholars. We'll try and link up with uh, universities or institutions in Pakistan and see how we can interact with them. So that there's greater knowledge. So we are not moving in the dark, but substantive enough for us to come up with an analytical report. Until then, thank you very much for coming. It's been a very good crowd. Uh, and we hope you always support our events. Thank you.